Hello, friends, and welcome to the Superhero Ethics Podcast. Today, I'm going to be talking about The Last of Us Part 2 video game with Danielle, written in the Star Wars, and Professor Matthew Capel. If you're a little curious as to why we're doing this, it's because I know that uh, the Part 2 of the show is going to be coming out. I know that I do not trust the internet not to spoil me on the things that happen in the game, which may or may not happen in the show, but there's a good enough possibility that I knew I wanted to play the game through... And I've done so, and there's a lot to talk about. And so we're presenting this as if you want to watch, if you want to either play part two and or watch season two and not get spoiled, this is probably not for you. I'd suggest hitting pause, then come back. If you've played part two, great. If you haven't played part two and aren't planning to, but you want to know all about it to kind of get ready for season two, then then this is also for you. Or if you've just wandered in, you don't care anything about this, but you're interested in ethical conundrums and what happens in a post-apocalyptic society, because in a lot of ways, The Last of Us Part Two, the zombies are now just a plot device, and we're just telling a great story about post-apocalyptic revenge and vengeance and family and how it all works, then maybe this is the episode for you. And we'll find... We'll find out more right after this commercial break that we have no control over. But if it's for any kind of global flour prop, you know, like like flour, like making bread, be careful. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. I'm Matthew, your host. Uh, as I said all that at the end, Matthew was silently gesturing to himself and pointing to himself in regard to the flower. I'll point out to Matthew that this is radio, not visual, um, but that we will quite possibly be webcasting pretty soon, in which case that will be awesome. Um, but Matthew, with all that, let me uh, ask you, introduce yourself and who you are and, and where you're coming from and what your experience with this game has been. Sure. Or, you know, just start with the introduction, then we'll get to the game. Sure. I was, by the way, gesturing at my wife who stuck her head in the door saying, to say I love you. So, um, oh, um, got it. It okay. makes a lot more sense now, doesn't it? <laughs> Hi, I, I'm Matthew Capel. I'm, uh, I teach at Pace University in Lower Manhattan, New York. I teach American Studies and Anthropology and sometimes writing. Um, and I also edit a book series uh, for a small press, academic press in the United States on game studies. So... At some point, there will be a book on this game. Uh, I haven't found the person who's going to do it for me, and I might have to do it myself. But but studies, studies in gaming exists, and you can just Google it with my name, and you will find it. And there's about 50 books in it now on everything from Call of Duty to Dungeons & Dragons. So it's awesome. And one day, I think there should be a Matthew Fox book. Quite possibly, quite possibly. I am currently under an NDA about uh, all things Wizard of the Coast, uh, given my time there. But I do – I love talking about uh, the ethics of Magic the Gathering. I won't say anything about the collection of cards that may or may not have been sent out improperly, uh, though I was surprised to learn that the Pinkertons do quite literally still exist uh, <laughs> as Wizards of the uh, – oh, yeah. Um, again, I – we'll talk off air about that one. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, and I, I will say relevant to this as well, uh, a friend of mine is getting ready to start a D&D campaign, so I was looking through the Druid class, because the Druids were fun in the uh, uh, recent D&D movie, even if they didn't properly show what a tiefling looks like, uh, and was reminded that there are many different, you know, kind of ways to be a Druid in D&D, one of which is the way of spores, and in this, you are a druid who has control over fungi and spores and can do things like at level six, reanimate a corpse with fungus. So, you know, if you want to play The Last of Us Dungeons and Dragons, the rules are right there for you. <laughs> um, Danielle. Tell us about, your, about yourself. Yeah, I'm Danielle, uh, written in the Star Wars on TikTok, DannyS394 on Twitter. And I'm also a PhD researcher at the very end, about to be, about to finally officially have that doctor title. So I will be Dr. Danielle. Very excited for that. And I love The Last of Us, so excited to talk about it. Nice, nice. I, I always love a gathering where my master's degree in uh, divinity and master's degree in uh, sociology of religion is completely outclassed by all of my guests. So <laughs> enjoy your academic debt and congrats on uh, all of that. And, uh, so awesome to have you both here. And I will start by saying, for those of you who are patrons, 
Uh, at the end of the last time I had Danielle and, and Matthew on, which is when we talked about Star Wars Celebration over on the Star Wars Universe podcast, I did a little bonus content where I talked about uh, The Last of Us video game, which I thought at that point I was about halfway through. And I thought, you know what, let's just do a little bit here. And then we'll when I finish the game in another couple more weeks, we'll get you back. Well, they both, as has been the running theme – did a very good job of not spoiling me that I was like one more big battle scene away from the end of the game. Uh, one more incredibly brutal battle scene away from the end of the game. But nonetheless, so that's why we have him back so quick. And I'm I'm really looking forward to this discussion because I do feel like The Last of Us, I think it, it's easy to think of it as just a zombie you know, show and game. And, and to some extent it is. But to some extent, we talked about this some in our coverage of season one, but I think even more in this one... And here's where I kind of want to start the discussion. This really felt to me like the zombies were no longer a major major part of the story. They were a way to build tension, a way to every now and then give you, the player, a chance to press some buttons and kill some things and use some weapons. But for the most part, the story is now not at all about the zombies. It's about we're in this post-apocalyptic society. There is no sort of overall, you know, system of law and order and justice. And, you know, we can say if that's a good thing or not. Maybe it's, there's, there's some definite advantages there. But the point is, when people are wronged, all they can really do is maybe try and go wrong the other people. And it it felt to me like this was – it wasn't even any more about, like, huge governmental systems and the Fireflies versus Fedra or anything. It's just about individual stories of revenge. And how we get caught in the cycles is that is that kind of how you took this took this game? Yeah, um, I think that when the show first came out, or right before it came out, um, I was you know seeing a lot of people talk about how you know they were kind of tired of you know zombie stories and like that was a fad mm-hmm. ten years ago. We're over it now. We don't really want to get back into that. And I was trying to say that. You know, this isn't a zombie story. It's a yeah. it's a love story, a story about love in many different manifestations, including the negative aspects of love, including the awful, horrible side effects of love that we don't like to often, you know, interrogate in ourselves. And it uses the zombies as a backdrop, and yeah. it uses the infection as a you know you know, something to add a little bit of tension and an instigator to some of these forms of love. But it's not about the zombies in the same way that, or in the way that The Walking Dead was. Like, and I know that all zombie media is saying something deeper than just, you know, zombies and infections. I get that. Uh, But for The Last of Us, for me at least, it feels like that is so much more apparent in this story Mm -hmm. than in a story like The Walking Dead, at least the show version of it, um, or, you know, iZombie or any of those other shows or movies. Um, And I think the second game really, uh, like, kind of tries to get that through as well. So unfortunately, it looks like Matthew's having some audio trouble. He's going to hopefully jump back in uh, in just a few minutes. But Danielle, just pick up what you're saying. I think that's such a good way of putting it in terms of how the... It feels like they were doing something so different. And what, one, like one thing I really noticed is from the game to the show, just the there weren't very many zombies in season one, you know. And I, it, it made me remember that uh, uh, in the show, um, in the in the game, they're popping up all the time. I don't think because it's supposed to be inherent to the story, but because just that's the fun part of the game is you're using the weapons to you know kill all the zombies and stuff. Uh, and I do think uh, Professor Doctor Matthew Capella is rejoining us. Because we were just talking about this idea of how, and I'm curious your thoughts on this, because I know you and I have talked before on air about how there is really interesting imagery and iconography around vampires versus zombies and like how those represent different fears and stuff like that. And Danielle and I were getting into the idea of how, particularly by part two, the zombies don't seem to be a central theme anymore. They're now just kind of a plot device to create this apocalyptic Every, everyone's out for themselves and their little communities. There's no overarching society or government or, or justice system. Uh, could, where, where would you stand on, on those kind of ideas? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, the zombies are the spoonful of sugar to help the rest of the narrative go down. Um, mm-hmm. Really. Um, and, and they're just there to 
give you something to shoot at um, in a non-ethically difficult spot um, so that you can get to the important parts. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do think that there, there is an aspect there of how the brutality of the fighting against the zombies it is so high. And I'm trying to think how best to say this, there's kind of a thought you've triggered that like, there's something about it that, that it, it helps tell me that like when you're, when your own, for me, the idea of like brutally killing someone is an incredibly difficult idea to think about. Um, both just cause, you know, killing is wrong, but also just because it feels so like, I don't know if I could make my muscles do those things. And I don't know if this is what you're getting at, Matt, but it, it feels like one of the things that the game kind of helps convey is that when for everybody, your daily existence is sometimes you have to take a baseball bat to the head of what was a human being, but is now a zombie, that that kind of makes the brutality against other humans, uh, unfortunately, easier to, 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 to handle. Or um, I think you could reverse that. Um it allows you to see brutality in a way that will make brutality against actual sentient beings harder to handle. Mm. You mean there for the player, not the character? Yeah, for the player, not the character. Yeah. I think there's, you know, I spent a lot of time killing things on my PlayStation, <laughs> um, um, as I think we all do. Um, but I tend to, like, pick games where the things I have to shoot at are not other people unless those people are wearing Nazi uniforms. Hmm. Yeah. So I kill a lot of Nazis, I kill a lot of robots, and I, I, I kill a lot of zombies. But I really don't like um, any game that requires me to kill a lot of people. Um, and I think Last of Us has zombies in it just to welcome you to the notion that there's a game here so that people who might not want to think too hard yet will get the message before they're done and go, well, shit, now I have to think about stuff, right? I think that um, one other purpose, the, zo the zombie aspect also, or, or rather, and, uh, there's a lot of debates about whether you can call them zombies or if it's just like the infected, whatever, but that the infection itself has uh, for the story, which is what is doing the most damage in this society after it collapses, the infection or the people, and mm -hmm. the infection is attacking the people, yes, but the people are also attacking the people. And it's, you know, you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place in that instance because, you know, there's there's no... There, there are individual communities that we see in this post-apocalyptic society that have joined together and protect each other, but that's not all of humanity that has done that, which is like, can you expect that? Should you expect that? Or will there always right. be differences and will there always be splits between people that make them go after each other? And I think that having that with a zombie-infected background is a really good kind of like, you know, there's this awful thing that's happening and yet we're still doing awful things to each other. And which is, is the case in most of, you know, human history that can be seen yeah. outside of a zombie apocalypse as well. Definitely. Let me give it just like a quick plot summary for those either who haven't played the game but are curious or who played the game some time ago and need to be reminded. We're not going to get too much into minute details of the plot, but this will hopefully give kind of a broad sketch. Uh, and I'm not going to go linearly in the game just kind of hit the main ideas so uh we start with um we're introduced to a new group of characters who are making a journey and there's a couple of them uh abby is kind of our main point of view character who's this very strong very buff woman um there's some kind of a love triangle thing going on with her and this guy owen and this woman mel and uh we learn that mel is pregnant and they're kind of going on this journey um, and we eventually realize that the journey that they're going on is because, is to go and kill Joel. Joel being one of our hero characters, our main point of view character from part one. Um, as more of the story unfolds, we learn that Abby is the, is the daughter of the doctor, the doctor who was going to operate on Ellie and hopefully cure the infectedness. Um, and so this is for her. Um, revenge, you know, and that on on some level, there's kind of a clear tension of that on some level, this is a a thing they should be doing because this could have saved the world, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But really, it's about her father and her father's death and her getting revenge. 
and and in what I think is a, a very uh, important moment for that, they don't take the, the group that goes to kill Joel doesn't take Ellie with them. Like there's no sense of this being about we're going to recapture Ellie so that we can try again to save the world. It is just about dealing with Joel because of the terrible things he did. Um, Abby then finds uh, Ellie finds this out. Uh, Ellie now needs to now go on her own revenge plot uh, against Abby. Um, and we also find out that Ellie is in kind of a love triangle. Uh, she is uh, she begins this relationship with another woman named Dinah. Uh, and it's a wonderfully portrayed lesbian relationship uh, or sapphic relationship. So happy that we get that, uh, including a very erotic scene between the two of them. Uh, we'll also get a, another erotic scene with Abby that is not what I expect in a video game. But again, you know, my days of Mario Kart and Zelda are clearly I, you know, I, I've grown up uh, as a video games. Um, but so Ellie goes on her own, her, her quest for revenge, uh, in part because Tommy already went as well. And she's trying to go and help Tommy. Uh, and then Dina and um, the guy who Dina was with uh, is named Jesse. Uh, so Ellie is now dating Jesse's ex-girlfriend. Uh, but the song Jesse's Girl is never mentioned by any of the 80s music <laughs> lovers, any of them in the game, which I think is a horrible plot flaw. Uh, but that being said, I'll put that aside. Um, they go to Seattle. In Seattle, they find that there's this whole backstory of uh, the Western Liberation Front, a group called the Wolves, took over the city from Fedra. Uh, and as Danielle was kind of saying, a story that plays out again and again and again in this world the group that was fighting tyranny winds up becoming tyrannical. So they're kind of ruling in a very tyrannical way. Meanwhile, there's this other group uh, of uh, a religious group that's referred to as the scars by everyone else because they have scars on their face as a religious ritual thing they do. Those two groups are kind of at war. Uh, Ellie gets caught in the middle of that war. Um, and we, we get to see both Ellie and Abby as they're making their way through this city, through everything that's happening, Abby winds up befriending a member of that other group, uh, a, a trans boy named Lev, which again is a, a beautiful piece of representation the way it's done. Um, everybody's going on adventures and side quests, and sometimes zombies pop up, but a lot of times it's humans who pop up. A lot of brutality happens. Eventually, we get to a point where Ellie and Abby have both killed most of the people who are most important to each other. Uh, Owen has been killed. Tommy has been killed. Uh, Jesse has been killed. Dinah does survive, uh, which uh, we'll get to in a second. Tommy survives, just real quick. Tommy doesn't die. Oh, you're right. No, no. He's shot in a way that looks like yeah. he's going to die, but you're right. He does survive. Um, and we get just this brutal battle between a Abby and Ellie. And my partner, Mary, who was the one actually playing the game, and I'm just watching. I'm not – my hand-eye coordination is just awful – and, and she was she she kept wanting to like put the controller down. She's like, I hate fighting this fight. And there'd be times where like one of them would be knocked down, and then the fight would go on. And she's like, Why isn't this done yet? Why? <laughs> because it was just incredibly brutal. And so uh, that fight ends finally with Abby getting the upper hand, but not killing Ellie, and just saying, Ellie, this is over. You need to be done. Ellie goes back and spends like a year and a half living this nice life with Dina. Uh, Dina, who was, the, uh, again, Jesse's girl, but the song's never sung. I'm not bitter about that, I promise. Um, uh, she has a child. Uh, Jesse was the biological father, but clearly her and Ellie are raising this child together. And it's the most lesbian cottage core situation you've ever seen. It's utterly beautiful. It feels like an epilogue until... Tommy turns up with news about where um, Abby is. And we realize that Ellie needs to go on yet another revenge plot. And it, it's this was the point at which that I was talking to the two of them in the Patreon, where both me and Mary were like, we don't want to keep doing this. This is why is Ellie doing this? Uh, but Ellie still has that need for the revenge. She tracks Abby to uh, Santa Barbara, where we've been told the fireflies now are. So again, like everything for both of us, we were because we kept thinking, OK, the point is eventually that Abby and Ellie are going to team up. Right. And that's when we'll get back to the Fireflies plot. That's when we'll get back to maybe Ellie will get to have her what she's always wanted, which is to, you know, her, her life to mean something. 
Along the way, she has found out all the terrible things that Joel did at the end of uh, game one, season one of the show. And she's clearly mad at him. She she wishes that she had let him that let it go forward, that she had died and her life would have meaning. Um, and there's all kinds of stuff wrapped up in that, obviously, but a lot of it's about her agency. And I think a big part of why she has this need for revenge on for revenging Joel's death is that he died with her still very mad at him. And obviously her feelings are very mixed up about that. And it's a kind of like, well, I could sit and process my feelings or I could beat up the person who caused these feelings. And in this world that we're always going to do option B, she gets to Santa Barbara. There's more adventures. Abby and Ellie have yet again, another drag down knockout fight. Uh, This time Ellie gets the upper hand. Uh, This fight is even more brutal. Uh, Abby is about to be killed. And uh, Ellie eventually just, again, thinking about Joel, thinking about everything with him, uh, decides to just let Abby live and walk away. And at which point Mary screamed at the TV, don't you dare make me keep playing this game. (laughs) Um, Because we were so mad that it was just going to be yet another, okay, but now someone else is going to go on a revenge plot and then they're going to get together and work together. But no, they just... And you just get to uh, Ellie gets back to Jackson, where everyone's living, finds that Dina, Dinah has left her and she finds Joel's guitar, plays it a little bit, thinks about Joel and walks off into the sunset. And that's the end of the game. Yeah. Did I miss any major plot plot stories? Um, I would say that. I mean, we can talk about this later because there's a whole, in my opinion, significance behind it. But during her last fight with Abby, um, Ellie loses two fingers on the hand that she uses uh, for the chords on the guitar. And so when Mm. she's playing the song that Joel played for her at the beginning of the game, she can't play it fully because she can't, she's not used to being able to play without those two fingers. And... Yeah. I, I'll admit we completely missed that. Yeah. I think because we were both so <laughs> wrapped up in the brutality of it all. But yeah, that makes sense. Understandable. That's, that's I've, I've played too. this game too many times. <laughs> that's fair. Well, so let's start so with let, the character of Abby. Me, I'm going to no, okay. I'm gonna add something too, which is it's important to recognize that before that last fight happens, essentially Ab- Abby is being crucified. Yeah. Yes. Um, and she is... She is taken down from a post in which she is essentially being crucified, and then the fight happens. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and and we have to remember what all of the symbolism of the crucifixion is supposed to be about, but it's mostly supposed to be about forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so that fight really operates around notions of, can vengeance keep going on? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, we'll definitely get to that. Uh, but let me just start with Abby, because... In, in many ways, I think this is one of the most risky but powerful things the story does is, you know, we all fell in love with Joel in Game 1, Part 1. We're all so angry at what he does at the end of Season 1, but I think many people still love him, love his character. I know, Danielle, you've talked about him so much. Abby kills him and doesn't kill him in battle. He, like, is lying knocked down on the ground and she beats his head in, Mm -hmm. I think with a golf club. Um, How how do we not hate Abby? What, what, like, because tell me about your journey about playing Abby, a character who killed the character you loved so much. Oh, it was hard. I remember um, when I first started playing, so when you first meet Abby is, as you said, uh, you, you don't know who she is. You just know that she's this stranger traveling, uh, and they, they see Jackson in the distance, and they're looking for this person, and you don't know who they're looking for. And um, you go off with Abby, and I'm like, okay, this is pretty cool. I appreciate that there's, you know, a, a, a female character that, you know, surpasses, you know, typical stereo- stereotypes of what a female character in um, video games looks like. And so I appreciated that. I was a little suspicious of her cause I didn't know like what was going on. Maybe she's someone to team up with Ellie or something. I don't know. And 
then you like slowly start to realize Joel helps, Joel and Tommy help her, which is the most heartbreaking part. It's so hard still to play every time I play it is you're like, no, Joel, Tommy, just leave her. Just go. I don't want Abby to die, but maybe she can find a way out herself. <laughs> just go away. Uh, don't tell her your name. Uh, and that to me was one of the best ways they could have introduced her because you don't know yet. You, you, you have suspicions, yeah. but you have no idea what, Joel's relevance to her life is and you still don't know you 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 don't know until you get to her part halfway through the game and then you go back and you are with her when she's 15 years old and Joel and Ellie arrive at the hospital and you slowly find out who her father is and um You literally have to play out those yeah. same scenes of Joel killing everyone but from her perspective. Yeah. And so I was When they made the switch between Ellie and Abby um, in Seattle, I was mad at first. I I wasn't mad, but I was like, they're really going to make me play as this person who killed Joel, who not only killed him, but as you said, brutally murdered him in front of Ellie. And I was like, absolutely not. I'm, I'm, I don't know how I feel about this. I even, I told him, like, put the controller down, went and told my boyfriend without any spoilers because he hadn't gotten to that part yet. I said, I think I might be mad. I think I might not like where the game is going. And he was like, really? You? And I said, yes, but I'm gonna, I'm just gonna stop playing today and then I'll go back tomorrow and we'll see how it goes. And slowly, they did such a good job of telling her story that slowly I, I began to understand and I allowed myself, I think it's so important to come to her story with an as open of a mind as you can have because yeah. you need to question yourself of if I'm excusing what Ellie's doing right now, if I've excused every death she's, done, she's dealt and the anger that she feels, How can I not excuse Abby's? Or maybe not excuse it, but understand it. Abby felt the same horror and anger and grief that Ellie felt. If I'm going to understand Ellie's, how can I not understand Abby's? And then I said this on the Patreon last time we talked about this, but the moment that I fell in love with Abby as a character, didn't just accept her, didn't just, you know deal with her but actually fell in love with her character is when she tells Lev you're my people after Lev has lost his sister and is you know has already lost his community in the Seraphites because they've turned their backs on him because he's trans um has lost his family and Abby has lost everything at this point too um Abby says you're my people And I just like, that still gives me chills. It still makes me cry. And that was the moment where I was like, I love Abby. I'm I'm never going to not stick up for her because she deserves the same understanding as Ellie does. And so many people in the Last of Us fandom don't give her that just because she killed Joel. And I feel like that line is so significant. And this is something we'll get into more or maybe we can dive into it now. But one thing I'm so struck by in the game is how every community loves each other and watches out for each other, but is incredibly insular and views everybody else as potential enemies. And that there are all these times where uh, Mary and I were almost joking about it by the end because I'd be like, oh, yeah, I want to learn more about the wolves. Oh, the minute Ellie gets close to them, they start shooting at her. <laughs> oh, I want to learn more about the Seraphite. Oh, wait, the minute Abby gets close to them, they start shooting. Like... All of these groups have a shoot first, ask questions later mentality, which to me feels very um, – I, what I would thought it, think of as Hobbesian, but um, uh, uh, the professor has, has pointed out that my reading of uh, Thomas Hobbes 35 years ago or 30 years ago is perhaps not uh, the best remember it. But, but just this idea of – that it's, it's – I'm looking for the right word, but it's just the, this idea that everybody is in their own, own little communities and views everyone else as a threat, which, which is, you know, unfortunately very much a reflection of our own world, but just taken to even more of an extreme. And so that act, for her to say that, it's not just, hey, you, you, a person, you're my family. I am from this one community. You are from the other community, and I'm seeing you as my family. 
that's the boundary breaking moment mm-hmm. that no one else in this world seems to be able to do. Yeah. The um the thing about zombie narratives is they're almost never about the zombies, right? Right. The thing about zombie narratives is they're almost always about how horrible humans can be to other humans. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can pick any zombie story going back to the early 1970s now, and you kind of get that, unless it's like I zombie or something, which is a little bit more comedic. Um, here, this is the one moment, Danielle is so right, this is the one moment where it undermines every other zombie narrative you've ever experienced. I mean, it's not just like, here's the point of this game. It's like, here's what this game is saying about every other zombie story you have ever thought about. And and that's what makes it really an emotionally wreck of a moment. Right. Well, and Matthew, especially for you as someone who has studied games, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people who I know who really love video games often either love or hate this game. Because one thing they often talk about is that the great I, the great part of video games as a form of media is how much control it gives you, the player. Whereas this one, and we'll talk, we've talked a little bit about the reasons for this, but we'll talk more about them. But as, as we've all said, like there are these things that we, the player, don't want to do, but you're not given an option. There's no other dialogue option. There's no other choice. Where does this kind of fit for you in terms of other video game narratives where – there is so little choice on behalf of the player of what happens next. The fact that there's so little choice is kind of the point, right? I mean, both games. Both games function in a way that if you're going to finish the game as the player, you eventually are going to have no choice but to do something you really don't want to do. The The, the way the first game ends is... You, you spend a lot of time in a hospital going, I don't want to be doing this. I don't want to be doing this. I don't want to be doing this. And then the game is over. Um, and then you lie, and then the game is over. Right? Um, and the second game takes that and just keeps doing it. You At no point do you want to do the thing you're doing, I think. Um, and so the I think the genius of this particular narrative is by forcing players to play Abby... Um, it really drives home the point that this, these are games about not having choice, um, which makes it powerful in a in a game narrative sense. Um, most open world games, and I'm not a big fan of open world games because they tend to be like, go find this plant, go find that plant. <laughs> um, um, most games give you lots of choice, and 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 then programmers and publicity people at game companies go you have so much you can do um and the purpose of these games is to show you that in real life sometimes you don't have choice and and that might be a thing we need to think about um so the first game is you know the overarching thing we always say about the first game is it's about the positive and negative aspects of love this game is exclusively about revenge yeah um and Revenge is almost never positive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I One thing I like about it, because I do, we talked last time also about, you know, the Cassandra aspect of this and how the player is Cassandra, because we, we know what they shouldn't be doing, but we are forced to watch it happen anyway and partake in mm-hmm. it happening anyway. But one thing I, I, I think is so interesting when it, it forces you to do things you don't want to do to characters you end up liking but it gives you the choice on how you maneuver through the um, through the what are they called the NPCs? Uh, how you maneuver through them in the hospitals, uh, out in the you know the neighborhoods and everything, because you don't have to kill everybody you come across. There are some instances you can completely sneak through, depending on your skill level, of course, of playing. Um, you can sneak through some of these neighborhoods. I've seen playthroughs where um, in the neighborhood where there's the most people that Ellie has to get through, there's people and dogs everywhere. Um, I've seen playthroughs of people completely sneaking their way through and they don't kill a Mm -hmm. single person, a single animal. And I think that that's so interesting because there, there are only a few, like if you want to call them like canon deaths, deaths that have to happen for the narrative. It's up to you how you progress through the rest of it. And I think that makes the choice 
there so much more meaningful when we don't have the choice elsewhere. Yeah. Because then it's like you're you're okay with killing all of these people, but you're not okay with killing this person or trying to kill this person and we're going to make you do that. Why are you okay with one but not with the other? And I think that that's a really interesting like philosophical question that they ask that they don't expect every player to to catch on to, I think, but it is there if you want to wonder about it. Like it's possible yeah. to not kill everybody, but sometimes you do, <laughs> and sometimes it's not just because it's easier. <laughs> Having to kill the dogs is bad. My other partner was visiting at one point while we were playing the game, and we just had to stop because for her, like, watching killing the dog. Bear. Not, not a thing we could do, and understandably. I said, but yeah, because some of the other dogs you really come to know. Yep. Like, I, I – and to me, there's such an – there's a couple of points there, but I want to start just with this one. There's such an interesting message here about our complicity in systems of violence and systems of, of vengeance and all this kind of thing because it's the – you know, I think there's an awful lot of truth, but an awful lot of moral e – it, it's very also morally easy to say, oh, they're just claiming they were following orders. They they should have disobeyed that they're totally wrong. And I – don't get me wrong. I do – I don't think I was just following orders as ever an excuse. But I think one of the things that we can often forget is how much, you know, in a horrible situation – where it feels like your choices have been far more limited. Uh, and again, kind of as you were saying, Danielle, actually, that's a perfect example. Sometimes they are very limited or sometimes just because of the world you've grown up in, it's hard to see any other option except killing the people there. You know, the, the idea you could do something, it's hard for you to even occur to you. There's such a powerful lesson here about how easy it is, yeah, to just become complicit and, and either to think, oh, it's not my fault because I had no choice or I hate myself because I had to do this. You know, I mean, there's just – there's so many ways you can go with it. But it really it, – it's what I like about the game is it's not hitting you over the head with here's the lesson. It's here's this hard question that these characters have to wrestle with. And by the way, player, now you do too. Yeah. Which is why a lot of really intense young men hate this game. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I also because it doesn't just let you go kill every yeah. have fun pressing the buttons and kill everybody with immunity. Yeah. Um and, and it doesn't let you um recreate a hero narrative hero narrative in your head. Mm -hmm. Um and, and, mm -hmm. and man we really love hero narratives, right? And um this game is very much like there aren't heroes and there aren't villains and there's context for everybody. Um and I don't know if say, 16-year-old me would have found that acceptable. Mm. Um, so I, I have a hard time judging people who really hate this game unless they're being toxic online about it. Yeah. Um, because I can totally see where they're coming from. Yeah. And the beauty of games in general tends to be that we allow people to be a hero, finally, instead of just read about them or watch them in a movie. Um, and here you don't get that. Yeah, I think it's I think it's interesting also to see the different ways that I see men and women react to this game because one of the biggest complaints amongst the like women and femme fan base for this about part 1 is that Ellie I wouldn't say she's two dimensional in part one by any means, but she is how, how much you learn about her is dependent on how much you pay attention to her as a player. And, um, because you only, you're only playing as her for a short time and all of the other interactions right. between her and Joel are, a lot of them are dependent on you pressing that green triangle to instigate conversation between them, to instigate dialogue. And one of the most refreshing aspects of the show was that, it forced that dialogue. It, it not not in a bad way. It's not like they forced it upon you, but they they made it a part of the story, and that you didn't have an option to skip over it. You didn't have an option to ignore her. Um, you had to watch her story play through. You had to learn about her. And part two, which I want to state, was co-written with a, a, a woman. I can't remember what her name is, but Neil Druckmann co-wrote this with a woman, and I think that that is very evident and very responsible of him because the two main characters are women and I like the fact that you know this game respected the fact that maybe sometimes a female writer 
knows just a little bit more about how a female character would react in these situations or how they should be portrayed, how they should be written. And um, part two has so many more female fans, I think, than part one, just because of how, you know, we're with Ellie most of the time. We're with Abby most of the time. And there's such a, I don't know, a feminine quality to the way that their disagreement the way that their um, vengeance against each other exists. It's not the same as Joel going after some, some other guy. It, you know, it's, it's not the same if it was Joel yeah. versus David, for example. Um, it, it's something different. It's, there's more emotion to it. There's more of a subtlety to it. And I appreciate that so much. And I, I know that I just I like that they took that turn for this game, and I know that a lot of a lot of uh, men <laughs> uh, to, online tend to have issues with that. But I just wanted to point out too that I wanted to say back when we were talking about Abby that um, like kudos to Laura Bailey, who is the voice actress for her, because a lot of Abby is her voice and is yeah. just how much Laura Bailey puts into that emotion when Abby's speaking. Yeah. Uh, Hallie Gross, by the way, yeah. I think I'm pronouncing the wrong. It's H A L L E Y. So I don't think it's Haley, but with Hallie or something like that. But Hallie Gross is the is the writer you're mentioning. The the, the gender aspect that that Danielle brings up, I think, is a really good one um, because it really does ex- what she's saying in that regard. Um, in the first game, one of the things that people say about the first game, and that Neil Druckmann has said, is he likes to watch people's reaction at the moment in which they realize they're playing Ellie, finally. And they're like, oh my god, I'm playing Ellie! Um, But that whole chunk of the game, and all of the second game, both of them remind me very much of this old um, Margaret Atwood quote, um, which I've always really liked. Uh, Margaret Atwood once said, she's the woman who wrote The Handmaid's Tale, once said, um, men are afraid that women will laugh at them. Hmm. And women are afraid that men will kill them. Yeah. Um, and when when Ellie is fighting David, it's it's that quote to me. Mm-hmm. And this whole second game is very much that quote to me. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's a really good point to say that um, Druckmann was very smart to bring on a co-writer um, who who was not another guy. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I um. I, going off of that, this isn't exactly related, but it kind of is, because a a big part of what part two asks the players to consider is the fact that Ellie has had one very important figure in her life, probably the, or one, she's had multiple important figures in her life, but one that goes above the rest of them, and that's Joel. Mm -hmm. And he is a violent man. He loves Ellie with everything he has, but he is a violent man. And he has passed on that propensity for violence to her through his love. And it's such a complicated thing when the person who teaches you the most about about love and family also teaches you the most about violence and vengeance. And I think you get the two mixed up in your mind. You get them, how do you love someone without seeking revenge for them? How do you love someone without getting so angry when they're taking from you that you take out an entire city? (laughs) Like, how do you, how do you do that? And I think that a large part in like Ellie's mind is her trying to come to terms with that as well, is that the way that Joel showed his love for her before Jackson was through violence. And maybe a part of her feels like she's not, because she was already mad at him when he died, that she's not showing him enough love if she's not showing enough violence. And I think that 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 has always been a question in my mind of it, is that it's such a difficult thing when those two things overlap. Yeah. I I think think there's there's so much truth there because... First of all, like the the game shows us two. Uh, first of all, the fact that Ellie's remembering primarily two things that that Joel did. One of which, as you said, is the violence and all of that. The other is his guitar playing, and I feel like that is there's a real 
important thing of what she's doing. She's trying to balance those two ideas of love. And I never really thought about it this way, but uh, until you, what you just said, but I think it's so true. I think there's a way in which her going on this revenge quest is somewhat her forgiving Joel mm-hmm. for what he did mm-hmm. because it's her recognizing that Joel, that as much as she hated what he did, he did that out of his love for her. Mm-hmm. But as, as we've said, that's the whole point is that his love for her became incredibly destructive. Mm-hmm. And now her love for him is becoming destructive. And I'm so glad he pointed out the thing about the fingers. Cause I, like I said, I missed it. Cause now I'm, I'm tearing up just thinking about it. Cause what you get is her attempt to love in the way he tried to love violently now yeah. means she can't love in the way he did peacefully in terms of guitar playing. Yeah. And like that alone is just such a beautiful message there. Remember that in the first game, one of the key moments is when Ellie says, everybody I've ever loved has either died or left me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so it's the, it's the perfect setup for yeah. anger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, um, I also really love one thing I have like come to accept. I, I think I've, I've played this game about six or seven times and I learn something different every time I play it. I come to a different understanding every time I play it. And my most recent playthrough, my understanding of it was that, um, because there's, there's a, there's a specific scene at the end when Ellie is about to kill Abby Abby's about to drown under her hands. Um, She has a brief memory of Joel, and it's just like two seconds of him playing the guitar on the porch. And we learn later that that memory is from after the dance when Joel, you know, stuck up for her and she got mad at him. And they're about to the they're about to have the beginning of their amends that will never happen. And uh, I've always wondered why that scene at this moment. Why that memory at this moment? Because those memories are very tied to the narrative. They're, they're where they are for a reason. And, um, but it's just, this one's not a full flashback. It's just two seconds of Joel playing the guitar. And, and what about it is significant to that moment? And I've always thought that Ellie, you know, Ellie never had a parental figure in her life until Joel. She didn't know what it was like to be a child to somebody. She didn't know what it was like to have a parent constantly there and loving her unconditionally. And she can understand that that's what's happening or accept that that's what's happening without truly understanding the depths of it. And I think that it wasn't that when Joel told her that he would take her being angry at him all over again, if it meant saving her life, he would do it. He would do it all over again, even knowing the consequences that in that moment, she began to understand that, that he loved her unconditionally. And then it wasn't until she was about to kill Abby that she realized he loved me so much to do those things, to give me another life, to give me a second chance at life. And this is what I've done with it. This is what I've done. Yeah. I've nearly gotten myself killed. I've killed all these people. And I think she starts to realize that Joel wouldn't want that for her, even if he would do the exact same thing. And yeah. I think that that's a very powerful message in that that's her finally coming to an understanding of if I kill this person, what will that do? It won't bring him back. It'll just mm-hmm. have been another waste of a life that he never yeah. wanted me to do. And that like that was my understanding this last time. I can't wait to see what else I come to on my <laughs> next playthrough. <laughs> and that also keys me into another part of it, which is that because one of the other things that happens, not in that flashback, but it's very tied up to them, is Joel being very clear that he is happy for Ellie with Dina. Mm-hmm. You know? And that that I think that's also a part of it because I think one of the things that is happening, you know, it is Dina doesn't specifically say if you go to Santa Barbara, I'm going to leave you. But she makes it like when we get back and Dina isn't there anymore, no one is surprised. I think yeah. Dina makes very clear that like, I really don't want you doing this. I'm not okay with you doing this. And so I think that's another part like, is that like, that's, you know, one part of what Joel wanted for her was to have more family mm-hmm. and her realizing that. Like, and I think that's part of the acceptance at the end is that like, yeah, that like my, my, my going on one more of these revenge quests lost me that. And, and, 
yeah, it just it all ties together so well. To a certain extent, I think a lot of the second game is built around the flashbacks. That that, yeah. that if you were just to string together the flashbacks, you'd have a pretty good story just with them. Yeah. Um, and for me, the one that okay, so I'm a space nerd. Part of my PhD oh. was on NASA, but um, man, that science museum oh. moment um, where oh. uh, she listens to the launch of Apollo 11 um, is the most strikingly hopeful moment in both games that there was this moment where humanity could have done so much and now we wander the world killing zombies and each other I'm glad that's your science geek moment because for me when I was a kid I wanted to be a marine biologist (laughs) because I wanted to be one of the people who worked with the whales and the dolphins (laughs) and so I got that kind of feeling all the stuff in the aquarium and just that sense of like Look where humanity used to be and look what we've lost. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to edit this. Oh, go ahead, Daniel. Oh, I was just going to say, I also really love in that moment um, two things. One is that we can see how Joel is looking at Ellie, but she doesn't see how he's looking at her because her eyes are closed and he's told her to close her eyes so she can imagine this. And that plays into the whole her not truly understanding the depths of Joel's love for her until it's too late. But then also the absolute power... Of, and I had, I've only just now thought of this, Ellie's obsession being space and this peaceful moment being in this museum with Joel talking about space and exp- listening to the tape and everything, which space is above, and Abby's being in the aquarium, which is about the ocean, which is, you know, the direct opposite of that. And that parallel, like I had never realized that until just now hearing you say like the parallel between um, you and, yeah. and Dr. Matthew. Um, but I, I just absolutely love that now. God, yeah. something new every time I'm telling you. <laughs> right? No, I think that's so true. And honestly, I think that's one of the most brilliant parts of this whole game is the way that, you know, most of the time, and Matthew, you were kind of saying this at the beginning in terms of like, if, if, if we want to be comfortable killing people, we make them robots or we make them zombies or often we make them coded as people of color or, you know, aliens who look like people of color see the Avengers and the Chitauri and all the research about that. And so having all these situations where not only are you having to – you pl- not on- like we have one character who sees the other as completely – all they see is the person who killed my father or the person who, who killed my father figure or any of these things. I mean they're, they're both dealing with the death of a father figure. But now we're no, but we, the player, have to play both of them, and we have to see those connections. Uh, the one that I know Mary kept focusing on, my partner, was how they're both collectors. Hmm. You know, yeah. Abby is collecting coins, mm-hmm. and Ellie is collecting uh, these comic book cards uh, and all sorts of stuff like that. And that alone, it, it's just, you know, I. If you listen to old superhero ethics episodes, one of the things I absolutely love is vi- is villains who aren't just mustache twirlers, but we get their backstory. You know, and that Batman has been very good at this for a long time. And this this to me is doing that to the point of, you know, there's the old adage of everyone's a hero in their own story. That's exactly what this is, though. It's that there is no easy way to see who's a hero or a villain. It's just whose whose point of view are you playing? That's going to inform who you think is the villain. Yeah, absolutely. The collecting aspect is such a humanizing part of them because Abby's is because that was her dad's obsession. And she carried that on after him because I don't think she collected them until that scene that we see. You don't see like any extras in her bag at the time. But um, I think that, you know, that just adds so much to it. Like Ellie has her comic book thing, which has so much more weight to it, I think, in the... Uh, aspect of the show now if they do keep the comic book card thing in the in the show too mm-hmm. um but yeah it's it's just another parallel between them that as you said this game does so well so i think it's possible that danielle is a genius <laughs> um the the ocean versus the space thing is is an incredibly useful way of thinking about this. Um, I immediately went to um, Jung, right? Because oceans for Carl Jung are very much about the unconscious. And 
Um, it's a metaphor for that. And one of the most important followers of Jung was Joseph Campbell, who said the space program was very much about finally closing the circle between the spirit world and the real world, mm. and finally understanding how the unconscious and the conscious go together. Mm. Um, and and I'm just like amazed by the insight you just had, Danielle. I mean, we're we're really talking about a much more complex representation of how people's emotional realities work, both for their benefit and against their benefit. And they and it's beautifully done by contrasting space with the ocean. Yeah. It's just beautifully done that way. Yeah. And I never, I've played it probably five times. I never thought of that. It's just great. It's just great now. thinking. Yeah, just now. Yeah. That's why it's so, I feel like it's so gratifying to talk about this with people because you can think of things on your own as you're playing it, but then you get other people's perspectives and it's just something clicks and you're like, oh my God, yeah, this thing. And so yeah. I really, I love this. <laughs> well, and it's what I love about podcasts like this, being able to have these conversations and hearing all these different things and like I said, I, I didn't even pick up on the thing with the fingers, and I certainly would have connected the the space and, and ocean in that same kind of a way. Um, playing on just the Campbell thing and, and knowing all of us love Star Wars, I, I, there, there, there are two kind of Star Wars points that I wanted to bring up and get your thoughts on. The, the first, a little bit facetious, but the second one, a little deeper. First, just in terms of what we were talking about a while ago about the um, the the young people, primarily men, who often struggle with this game because what they're looking for in a game is clear lines of, you know, right and wrong, good and bad. I tend to, th I, I have to imagine that, that the Zen, the, can't believe I made that mistake twice, the Venn diagram of, uh, you know, the, those fans and the fans who are really upset about The Last Jedi or Endor has to have an awful lot of overlap in terms of, you know, people, not they want Luke just to be the hero. They want Joel just to be the hero. You know, they don't want the moral complexity and all that kind of thing. Um, but going a little further on that, one thing that I'm very struck by is, you know, one of the central ideas of Star Wars is this idea of that if you hate, that, it, that love is great, but if you hate the thing that endangers what you love... That, that that's the path to the dark side, you know, mm -hmm. and that's everything from, you know, Anakin's fall to when Rose uh, uh, saves Finn and, you know, about, you know, we don't win by fighting things we hate, but but protecting the things we love. It, overall, and, it, and it's the story that's told again and again of when you hate the thing that threatens you, you dehumanize it, you stop seeing it as anything except the enemy, and, and now you're willing to justify any terrible thing you do. Mm -hmm. Am I right? That's basically the story of this, like that, that, that idea of like not a spiritual dark side to that kind of a way of the force, but just that, that same idea of when the person you love is endangered or is killed and all you feel is hate towards the ones who did it. Now you become just as brutal as the people who did the things like it, it feels very much a this is the dark side that, that Lucas was talking about. Well, I think I think it comes from we view these acts of vengeance and revenge as selfless sometimes. We view them as for the person that they're for, but they're not. They're, they're for us. They're to make us feel better about what has happened, to make us feel like we did something or that we had control over an event that was uncontrollable. And I think especially for Ellie, that's true. And Abby, uh, in that they had no control over what happened to their respective fathers. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they want to take back that control by taking away the control from the person who did that. And um, that is a very selfish act that is understandable because we all do it in small ways even in our daily lives. Yeah. Um, but when it's on this magnitude where it leads to the deaths of so many people and to the deterioration of your own self, then that's when it becomes an issue. And I think that in Star Wars or any media or any franchise really that tackles this question is that that's what the problem is. And when Rose says, um, you know, we, we should protect what we love instead of fighting what we hate, protecting what you love is the purest form of love. And that is the selfish part yeah. or selfless part of love. Whereas hating is the selfish part. It's, yeah. it's very much the old Buddhist line, which is something like 
if you really want to anger the person who has harmed you, forgive them. Hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, which is, I think, very central to Star Wars um, and is the journey both Abby and, and Ellie are on in this game. Yeah. To go yeah. from, I'm going to harm the person that harmed me to, I will forgive the person that harmed me. Yeah. Right. Yeah, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a, is a Buddhist monk, but has written a lot about some of the overlaps between Christianity and Buddhism. Uh, that particular line is one he talks about a lot, quite a, because it's, it's obviously a central theme in, in Christianity and in Buddhism and in a lot of other uh, faith perspectives, but those two especially. Um, and, and yeah, you're right. And I, I, I love, uh, Danielle, what you're saying about control, because that's Anakin's thing as well. Mm-hmm. He's a, he wants to be in control of everything. His mother is killed and he wasn't in control. So he lashes out and kills all the Tuscans. Uh, Padme is going to die and he can't be in control of it. And so his, his option is therefore I'm willing to do anything, including, you know, helping this emperor and, and killing Mace Windu to protect, to, to, you know, and that's weird because there it is. You think when he's, it, it, that's almost more of what you were kind of saying at the very beginning about how it can become corrosive. He is acting out of a desire to protect the things he loves. But it's it for him. It's become that corrosive of I will do anything. Joel is acting to protect the thing he loves. Um, oh, I didn't even thought about that way. That yeah, it, what Rose Tico says is so true, but also itself can become so corrupted. Mm-hmm. You guys, are, you guys are really smart. So. <laughs> so are you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so, so much of this is connections you're helping point us to. So low, let's get, get, give everyone credit while we're patting each other on the back. So I, I, have a, I have a question that might help us move forward slightly, but here's my question. Sure. Um, the first game very much was a one-season HBO show. I mean, mm-hmm. there was no place to cut the first game and make yeah. it two seasons. Um, the second game is... I don't know, three seasons worth of stuff? I mean, it's a big game. Where do you make the cuts? Where does the first season, the second season of HBO's Last of Us have to end with the narrative from the second game? I did. I know, I I, I think I know where they will end it, is the obvious place, but I'm curious what you both say. I did a, a video about this on TikTok because I wanted to see other people's opinions as well and work through my own because I absolutely love the way that the game is set up. I don't know that it's conducive to television, especially a TV show with an audience that is so even more attached to Joel than the game players were because they're Pedro Pascal fans. <laughs> and... Um, yeah. And on one hand, they're used to seeing him die, so maybe they might be prepared for it. On the other hand, I have already seen like a lot of people say that they're not going to keep watching once he dies, which is such a stupid way to approach a show. But um, And it's very disrespectful to his part in the story anyway, because his part in the story doesn't end when he dies. Even if we never saw him again in the flashbacks, his spirit is there through Ellie. And um, But anyway... And so I have wondered if they're going to keep the same structure of the game because I love it. I don't know. I don't know if if it's conducive to television. And I wonder if they might like start with the flashbacks instead and have the season end where you find out who Abby is and what she's on a journey for. And then that way you get Pedro Pascal for a whole season and then part of the next season after that. So you get him a little bit longer. You get um, to, to dive deeper into the emotional connection between him and Ellie a little bit and take time to, you know, t- talk about what has happened in the space between the end of season one and, season t- and the beginning of season two. So I don't know. I would love to see them keep the structure of the game because I, I love it, but I don't know. There's something about like the, the game makes you keep going. You have to keep going. But when you're watching yeah. a show, you don't have to keep watching. You can stop whenever you want. And I, I worry that that might play into their, into their thinkings. It is such a great question. And it's one where I think... I hate that this is a thing because I want artists to have just, you know, a purity of tell the story the way you want to tell it. 
But the fact that HBO is does episodic television, not binge television, and the social media environment, mm-hmm. honestly, I think is the biggest reason why they couldn't do it the way they do it. Because I would love it if a whole bunch of viewers get to have like two episodes of Abby and Owen and Mal going on this journey and being helped by Tommy and Joel all to get to this shocking realization that they're there to kill Joel. Yeah. I think that would make for some of the best television ever. I I think you would have to live under a rock, <laughs> come out of that rock to watch one episode of HBO a week, go back under the rock and not exist in any other way in the world on the internet in order to not find out before that reveal that Abby is going to kill Joel. Yeah. Like, I just don't know how they could do it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I feel like if they were going to do three seasons, the way I would think it would be broken up would be however you get there, season season one ends with Joel's death. Uh, or season two ends with Joel's death, quite possibly with a lot of flashbacks there. Season, th- season three ends with the second of the next coming se- the sec yeah you know what i mean the second of these seasons would end with abby letting ellie go and ellie going back to cottage core paradise with the last scene being tommy showing up and saying i found abby hmm. and ellie looking determined and dina looking heartbroken and then season 3 would be the journey to santa barbara and all that would happen and it would give but- them time I'm convinced there's a Last of Us Part 3 coming. I am convinced. <laughs> Troy Baker has been has been leaving some hints. I I am convinced that there's Last of Us Part 3 coming. Um, they've not announced it yet, but I, I'm absolutely convinced. They, they would be stupid not to make a third one. Well, I mean, Neil Druckmann has said he only wants to make a third one if it makes sense for the story and if it would be respectful to the story. And I do appreciate that. But also, there's got to be like some money, some money-making chimes in his head because... <laughs> I, I hope you're right, but the icy ball of fear that formed in my heart as you said that about any idea where a story is being told in one medium mm-hmm. but hasn't been finished oh. told in another medium. Game of Thrones. Yeah, Game of Thrones has poisoned all that for me so much. But but, but the good but, thing is is that Neil Druckmann is intrinsically tied to the show. So that's true. That in, that's true. in a way that George R. R. Martin never really wanted to be. Um, yeah. And and so I think that that would also give time for the story of season of part three to be integrated into a potential season three, because I don't think that there's enough material in that last like quarter of the game of part two to be a full season on its own. Yeah. But you could bring in, uh, you know, kind of ties to a potential future part three and if it if we got a season three that would probably come out in like 2027 um that's potentially when a part three video game could come out or around the same time so you never know you never know matt what were your ideas about uh where it could go where it might end well i i don't i i have published some short fiction in my life but i am not a writer I'm, I'm I'm not good at framing stories. Um, I don't, but I don't see how the first season doesn't end with the death of Joel. Yeah. Even if the next season has a lot of the Joel flashbacks to mm-hmm. keep Pedro Pascal around. Right. Yeah. Um. I I actually I was talking about this game with a a. a a husband of a friend of mine, a guy from Sky, actually, um, and, um, who said, I never played the second game because I know what happened and I'm not going to play that. Yeah. Right? Um, and so I see where people are coming from in that regard. But, but I still think if you start fumbling the um, narrative uh, enough to keep Pedro Pascal around more, mm-hmm. you're going to undermine the actual point of the story. Yeah. And I don't think, I don't well, think Craig Mazin or, or Neil Druckmann are going to let them underline, undermine the point of the story. And, and Neil Druckmann and uh, Dave Filoni might have to have a talk sometime about, okay, when, do, when does Pedro get to go play with one of them? <laughs> and when does Pedro get to play with the other one? Because yeah. it, depending on what the plan, I, I, I hate to say it, but whatever the plans are for post Mandalorian TV shows and movies and stuff, you know, Pedro's only one person. He's only got so many hours in the day. 
So well, I wouldn't, that would probably also have an effect. I wouldn't be surprised if he prioritizes The Last of Us. I would if I was him. That I, think I mean, okay. that's that's the next step of his career <laughs> that he's waited for for yeah. so long. Um, but no, I because absolutely... Because we can see his face. Yeah. I absolutely <laughs> believe that they're going to keep Joel's death. Um, I just think that if it was the stru- same structure of the game, his death would happen in, like, episode one. Uh, episode two and I could see them mm-hmm. wanting to stretch it out include some of the flashbacks before they have his death and like keep it at season one yeah. but Neil Druckmann has said that he doesn't care what people didn't like about the game he said I'm staying true to it I don't care and I'm like thank you Neil <laughs> and Craig Mason's a huge fan so I know that he'll want to stay as as true to it as as yeah. possible yeah it, it'll be fascinating to see. I think a really interesting class in terms of media adapta- mm-hmm. adaptation and things like that. I can't wait. That was my favorite part, let, season one. Let me ask one more big question, and then we're going to kind of wrap up. And I, I, one day I'm going to set myself a challenge of the three of us trying to do an hour of conversation. <laughs> I don't think it's possible, but I'm going to try. But I, I, I'm so grateful for both of your time. But Because, Matthew, you know, this is a topic you were particularly interested in. I thought – you know, I'm a study student of religion, sociology of religion. So introducing a religion that is formed in these times was fascinating to me. And again, I was I was deeply frustrated that we never really got to sit with the history and the theology of this new religion. But again, realizing that it, that's not what the point – because the point of the story isn't about – the societal changes and the wolves versus Fedra and like how should this world be governed? It's just about two people with revenge fantasy, with two people playing out their own revenge needs against this larger backdrop. But I'm curious from both of you, and but I'm Matthew, I'll start with you. What did you think of the way they introduced that religion and 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 the where it went uh, in terms of both storytelling, but also just the sociological idea of like yeah. Of course, religions would would start to come about in this kind of post-apocalyptic world. Well, if there's one thing that um, historically it turns out America is really good at, it's um, inventing religion. Um, Our national narrative is very much that. But, I mean, go to the 19th century in upstate New York and you can't throw a stone without hitting a new prophet. Um, And... Yay, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, so it's not surprising at all. But it's but it's also, I think, the, the most important thing to me of that new religion is how quickly it got undermined. Um, and I think that's the main point. Um, and that's why, that's the main point for its existence is to show how easily the affair i'm going to use i'm going to use the old fashioned sexist way of saying this but how easily the affairs of men can be corrupted yeah. um because here is a new religion that in which the founder is a woman um in which therefore gender had to have been a thing in which one of the main non playable characters of the story is a statement about gender who is rejected by this religious community. Right. You're talking about Lev, the trans Lev, boy. Yeah. Rejected specifically because he, he, he shaves his hair, which is something that women aren't supposed to do in their community. Yes. Um, so, so I think very much um, the fact that the, the religion seems to have its reformation almost immediately um, is kind of the point. And that point is a bigger point, which is no matter how humans try to organize the world, they're not good at it. Yeah. Um, and when it's trying to organize the spiritual world, we're even worse at it. Yeah. Right. And you, Matthew, as a real student of religion, know that much better than I do. But um, the last 2,000 years of the history of the Christian religion is point after point after point of people arguing, no, that's not right. Mm-hmm. right? And, and often doing so with swords and then with guns. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, and I, I'd be very interested to hear more. Neil Druckmann is that how you say his mm-hmm. name? Yes. Yeah, I would be curious to hear more of his thoughts on religion because I don't think it's coincidental that the man who wrote the the Seraphines, the Scars, and as he said, take this core of a religious idea that seems healthy but turn it very violent and very oppressive very quickly. That's the same person who, in part one and season one, wrote 
all of these characters who, yes, are doing things that are hard for our main characters, but all have a core of, if I was in their shoes, I might do the same thing they were doing, except for one, David, who's a religious leader. Um, I think there's a really interesting parallel there and a really interesting statement being made about how as much as there's a like, if you understand everything from every person's side, they're the hero. When religion gets in, it's a lot harder to have that like, well, they're just from a different point of view because the religion often becomes our way or else for everyone. Well, it's important. I think. It, oh, sorry. Oh, I think you were probably going to say this. <laughs> so go ahead. <laughs> it's, it's, it's important to recognize that Druckmann is an Israeli Jew. Yeah. Um, so he brings both the Israeli part and the Jewish part to his discussion of religion. Yeah. And, and I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, I, and I, I will say I did really appreciate that Dean, uh, uh, Dinah is Jewish herself and her Judaism is a part of her character in some very important ways that were mentioned that I really like. If you look online at the toxic backlash to the game, it's, it's, it's weird how people are almost more upset about her Jewishness than her lesbianness, <laughs> right? Or bisexuality. Yeah. Um, but, th but they're definitely upset about both, but you can tell what kind of person it, they are by which one is more upsetting. Yeah. Right? I had to go to a synagogue with a <laughs> bisexual. <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating. That's fascinating. I, I, and just, I'm glad you also mentioned, I do like that the show has – Dina leaves a man for a woman. Mm -hmm. And yet it is never – it never does any character ever say that's what it's about. Ellie never makes a joke about, I'm glad you're, you're finally playing for the right team. Mm -hmm. She says, you know, oh, God, I can't believe I ever thought I was attracted to men. She's There are two people who she's attracted to in the story. Her relationship with one of them ends. Her relationship with another begins. And the fact that they are different genders has nothing to do with why that happened. Yes. And that there's never a moment of thinking that her now being attracted to Ellie means that she wasn't attracted. And, and Ellie, though, I think is very clearly gay. I think she is, hasn't expressed any attraction to men at all. And I, I love that we can have both of those characters. So this is a completely different <laughs> tangent of what you're saying, but I just needed to go off on that quick thing about uh, Dinah being awesome bisexual representation. Um, but it's also important. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm shutting up. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, I was just gonna gonna say about the the Seraphites and learning more about them. I think this is one thing that Neil and the rest of the creative team uh, at Naughty Dog, who produced the Last of Us games, do with this game is that they 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 intrigue you by wanting to learn the story and piecing it together by the letters and, you know, the flyers mm -hmm. that you find, the little carvings and everything. Um, but they leave just enough out that they can tell the story elsewhere if they want to. And that's such a yeah. good marketing ploy, such a good, but also just like a good narrative ploy as well, because it leaves things open for future exploration. And I think that that is one thing it has in common with Star Wars, because Star Wars does that as well. And um, I think they're finding that incredibly useful when it comes to adapting it to a TV show, because then you have a lot of different narratives you can explore. You have things that can fluff up a season a little bit more than just the, you know, the uh, Ellie just traveling through Seattle is not going to make a really great TV show on its own, but you can break it up with looking at the Seraphites. You can break it up with looking at the right. wolves by maybe going, starting a little bit earlier and looking at how the conflicts between the two started. <coughs> and I could very easily see them starting some episode in season two by looking at the fall of Seattle and um, wolves versus seraphites to set that narrative up. And they can do that because Neil and his team and the team around him created that open space. And I think that's such good world building on his part. And there's so much that goes into it. He's talked before about with things from part one in going into season one that he has written all of this. <laughs> like he's, he knows the story behind it and there's so little that he gets to put in the game. But when it comes to the oh. show, he can just give that to Craig and Craig's like, great, I can write this in. <laughs> yeah. Like in the same way during our episode on Star Wars Celebration, I said like, I want the West Wing show <laughs> about the Senate on Coruscant. I want the full history of Fedra. Yeah. Like give me the politics of it all. Um, but I think the more important thing I was going to say about that is that Danielle, you mentioned a while ago how 
you could play through the first part of the game and not learn anything about Ellie because you don't notice her reactions and you don't click, you don't press the button when the green triangle appears above her head and all that kind of stuff. I think this game does that even more where you could go like so much of the story of this game is through all the letters that Mm -hmm. we find. And there are characters who I feel like I know pretty well, but we never see them on screen. We just read their letters and it's beautiful storytelling, but it also sort of goes to his main point because you could approach this game as I just want to press buttons and use cool weapons to kill people and never learn their story. And what a message is that about hate and about violence and about how the idea of I just want to kill things and never learn their backstory. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the problem with every military in the world, especially ours. Yeah. What I love about about Neil and Craig is that they've kind of talked about this on their podcast for the show. Um, mostly when when they're talking about the end of season one and they're like, You can you can what if this situation all you want. You can say, Oh, well, what if the the um you know the I can't even think of the word. The inoculation doesn't work. Like, what if the cure doesn't work? You know, it it can't work because of this, this, and this. Um, How are they going to get mass? How are they going to spread it in a mass, you know, manner? They can't do that. So Joel was justified in doing in doing all of this stuff. And they said, like, they actually said, if you do that, you're missing the point of the story. (laughs) Like, (laughs) like don't don't do that. Make yourself uncomfortable. Take away those what ifs. Take away those explanations of you know, of trying to defend Joel's actions and just look at the action for what it is in that moment. And that's the point of the story. And I think in a like, kind of a, a reverse way is that's the point of the whole game is if you just play straight through and don't do any of this stuff, you can, but you're missing the point of the story and you're not engaging fully in the way that the creators want you to, want to you to engage with. You're not getting the full story. And so I always think it's interesting when when you talk to usually like the toxic fans of it about it and they're like, oh, you don't have to do that. I don't have to read all this stuff. I don't have to like learn all this stuff. I'm like, congratulations. You are not getting the story that you think you're getting. Mm -hmm. Like you're not, you're not actually getting the full story. You're not understanding it. You're not engaging with it the way that you don't have to, but Why wouldn't you want to? Why would you spend that much money on the game? (laughs) Why would you spend so much time playing it if you're not going to engage with it fully? Which people are allowed to do, but I I, I don't understand. (laughs) I'm now very much looking forward, not that I want to encourage toxic social media, but I'm looking forward to when we will invariably get the, why is this character on screen? Blah, 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 blah. (laughs) And then so much makes a TikTok response where they just put the letter of like, here's that character. (laughs) They are in the game. You just missed them. Yeah. Uh, Well, I think that's about a good play. In our patron section, we're going to talk about some other video games. We'll do it very quickly. Uh, But is there any other last points either you wanted to make about this game? Um, I think Matthew said this earlier, and I agree. It is... Which one? uh, Dr. Matthew said this earlier. (laughs) (laughs) I really hate that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I truly believe this is one of the best video game narratives ever. And for me, it's probably my favorite story, period. Um, And I just I think it, it can become that for people if you give it the chance, if you if you if you allow yourself to be uncomfortable, like Neil and Craig have said, you're supposed to feel uncomfortable. You're supposed to question yourself. You're supposed to open your mind up to more possibilities and more in-depth discussions with yourself and interrogate yourself. And to me, that is, is the, is the most beautiful part of the story is that it forces you to do that. Which is the most beautiful part of just about any story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That that's why humans make stories. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's to me, the whole ethos of this podcast is, is taking these stories that don't have the right answers, you know, that are about, uh, these hard questions. First of all, just to fully understand and appreciate, if you don't appreciate just what that means when Danielle says this is her favorite story, please go to her TikTok 
and just search for the words Rogue One. <laughs> because that's the level of, of utter love for a story that's not her favorite. <laughs> so that's how high that bar is set, because your love of Rogue One is phenomenal and has taught me a lot about that that story, uh, including the novelization, which apparently everybody should read. It's my Bible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like, and this kind of goes to what you're saying before with the philosophy part of the the people questioning the situation this is going to sound like a terrible thing but i'm I, i'm a little bit of a defender of trolley problems mm. like yes when they become intellectual exercises for people who aren't affected by it it becomes really problematic but i think the idea of setting up a situation of when you're faced with a terrible choice how would you choose and what does that say about you is an interesting moral philosophical question and when people just want to say, oh, but let's play with the question and not make you make the choice, you're missing the point. Yeah. And all of humanity being saved versus saving the the person who's become my daughter is quite literally a trolley problem. Mm -hmm. And that's what Joel has to do. And and yeah, so I just I, I, I really appreciate the, the, the way you brought that up and, and all there. Uh, Non-doctor Matthew, uh, uh, how, offline, how do you what's the actual best way to refer to you? Professor, Doctor, Matthew, Matt, MWK. Well, I, I, I definitely don't like Matt, but um, okay. Um, but okay, so I have a I have an old friend who's a from from one of the families, an Italian New Yorker, um, who's known as uh, you know they, people called him Nicky, um, and he used to call me Maddie the Head. So how about Maddie the Head? Maddie the that, Head. That, that's kind. That's kind of my. That's kind of my organized crime name. <laughs> okay. But uh, I thought no. I was going to take all that out, but no, I'm keeping it in. Yeah. Sure. No, so, but but uh, you, you can call me anything you want, and um, okay. I'm, I'm very proud of the damn doctorate, so I'm not going to really complain about it. Yeah. Okay. Well, would you prefer doctor or professor? Doctor. Doctor. Okay. Um, all right. Well, so Doctor Maddie the Head, do you have any other last things you want to say before we wrap up? I think that we got a lot of, in the first HBO season, we got a lot of flashbacks that aren't in the game, which tips their hand that we're going to have a lot of flashbacks mm -hmm. going forward. Yeah. Um, and I think I'm very much looking forward to finding out more about the narrative than my five playthroughs of the game have given me. So yeah. I think that's e what episode about. Episode three of season one alone tells me that some of those like stories we saw play out in the letters will probably meet those characters on screen yeah. and get their whole stories. Yes. Yeah. In ways that'll be really powerful, and that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both so much for being a part of this. As I said in our patron section, I'm going to ask them about some other video games they love. Uh, but for those who aren't uh, going to hear that, uh, just quickly, where can people find you? Uh, I am on TikTok at Written in the Star Wars, and on Twitter at Danny S three nine four. I'm always talking about Star Wars and The Last of Us. So check it out. Yeah, great content. We're checking out Matthew. And um, I'm old, so I'm not anywhere. Um, but you, <laughs> but but you can you can find my webpage, which is matthewcapel.com, and where I essentially tell you what I've taught and why you should buy books. Um, yeah. And um, if you search for studies in gaming and my last name, Capel with one P, um, you'll get to that series. And there are a lot of really smart people, smarter than than me, who have done books for that series about some of the most important games that have um, ever been released. So take a look at those. Those are definitely worth buying. My publisher yeah, wanted definitely. me to say it that way, too. But <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. I, 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 I'm hoping your publisher is one day my publisher. So <laughs> it's good to keep that person happy. And, of course, I am Matthew Fox. I am The Ethical Panda. Uh, you can go to theethicalpanda.com. You'll find all the podcasts. Most importantly, you find ways to contact us. Let us know what do you think about the game if you've played it. Uh, what are you excited for for the upcoming seasons? What are you worried about? Uh, how do you feel about all this? Could you learn to love Ab Abby? Uh, we didn't even talk about there's so much more about her character we didn't <laughs> get into. Um, uh, let us know. All that show information is at theethicalpanda.com. Of course, also think about becoming a patron. I love doing this show. It is a lot of work. There's a lot of expense that goes into it. The patrons really help to make that possible. Uh, you get bonus content, as you're about to hear, if you are a patron. So please think about that. All that information is, again, in the show notes. So on, beh so on behalf of myself, Matthew, and Danielle, thank you all so much for being a part of this. We have spoken. First time seeing a monkey. <laughs> First time seeing a monkey. <laughs> Such a good one.